Welcome to The Lisa Show. Hey, we should be having this conversation over lunch. This is Lisa Show producer McKay Menden. And this week, as we concluded our 11-part series on self-care, we wanted to take a look back and see what actually changed in our lives as we explored what it means to take care of ourselves. So I jumped into the studio with Lisa and my fellow producer, Becca Hurley, so we could talk about it. Thanks so much for joining us today. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, happy to be here, Becca. Happy to be here. So my first question that I want to ask you about is uh, just about this: your definition of self-care, where it was before we started doing this for 11 weeks, and where it is now. We'll start with you, Mickey. I think the biggest thing that I've learned about what self-care really means, because, I mean, as a producer— I helped pitch the idea for the season. So I knew that there was more to it than just the superficial idea of spa days and face masks. Um, but what it really came down to me after kind of working on this for months and months is how it all really just comes back to intentionality, which is very much so a buzzword in its own right compared to self-care. But just the idea of taking a step back, looking at your life, whether it's your job, whether it's you know, your family, whether it's your mental health, whether it's whatever it is you're talking about, taking a step back and looking at where you've been and where you want to go and then deciding what you need to do to go where you want to go. Um, that's like It's completely redefined my idea of self-care and really what taking care of myself is. It's not just taking time off, but it's taking time to understand where you are and where you want to go and how you can take steps to make that happen, so... Yeah, and I think it, that's helped me too because so many things that people say when they talk about self-care seem very unapplicable to me. Um, Can you give an example? Well, sure. Like face masks, for example. That's another. That's maybe a superficial example, but like I actually did one for the first time this weekend, and I felt nothing. I felt wet and gross. <laughs> it, I, by the time we were done, I was just like, "Please take it off, please." Amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank. I thank you. I, I, after we got done, I asked my wife, "Am I glowing?" And she's like, "I think. I don't know." It's. It's just. I mean, that's just an example of something that just felt like, okay, this doesn't make me feel soothed or anything, or bubble baths or spas or whatever. But when I take kind of that idea of intentionality, I realize like, okay, for me, like going rock climbing or like, I don't know, like reading books in hammocks, specifically in hammocks. This is a different experience. But I, something like that um, is kind of what I need on a day-to-day -day basis that, that helps me to feel like I'm going where I need to be going. And there's a lot of big picture things, career choices and financial moves that kind of also fall into this. But there's just a lot of things that I can do that I don't hear about other people suggesting that I do, um, but that I can come to the conclusion that I need to do when I'm thinking of self-care in, um, in that way. My brain is spinning off on a tangent of McKay, like creating a line of masks for bearded men. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, the, the bottom mask, half has like a conditioner. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, it's more of a yeah. The one I had, we just cut it in half. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, that helps. So you didn't even get the full experience. Yeah, that's true. Self care maybe, hack. Maybe, maybe that's where I needed it. My <laughs> my mental health was all sitting here in my lower cheekbone. <laughs> you know, you they, missed so. it. They say that stress is carried in the jaw. Yeah, there you so. go. Oh, yeah, I missed it. <laughs> yeah, that's why I didn't feel anything. That's true. What about you, Lisa? Obviously, we wanted to do a series on self-care because I felt like I was having the same kind of conversations with my friends about, like, just there's not enough time. And there's other things that are, like, more pressing than that. And it really kind of bothered me because I just thought, okay, yeah, but to what end? And then what? And, and what does it all mean? <laughs> you know, a little mini existential crisis every now and then doesn't hurt, right? And Is I think that self care. <laughs> yeah, I think mini so. Yeah. Well, I, existential crisis. <laughs> well, I, I, it's certainly a, a, an opportunity to, like McKay was talking about a little bit, being intentional, which I think from the beginning, I thought. Self-care is just nurturing yourself and taking care of yourself like you would someone that you love and value it. And I think that after this series, I think it's more than that. I think that it is valuing your life and really living your life as if you don't have to prove anything to anyone, but that you already have that value and that sort of divine worth and how you express it is self-care. And I think for me, 
I started on this sort of journey of discovering this after my husband died because he was the one, he was a great partner, and he was one in my life who would be like, hey, you need to slow down. Hey, you're stressed out. You need to do this. And he would offer suggestions and opportunities for me, almost like I needed permission or something. That it, 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 And so when I found myself and I didn't have that and I could just clean the house until three in the morning and then get up and exercise and go to work and just go, go, go. There was no one telling me, hey, maybe that, maybe that's not a great idea. Like maybe you should do that. And so I, I don't want my children to fill that role of having to take care of me. And so that's the reason why I was able to give myself permission to that because I wanted to keep them from that because I thought I can't burn out because they've already... They've already lost a parent. <laughs> Not to be like super dramatic, but like I need to be at my best self because I'm all they have now. And I really felt that. And um, it's been really sort of hard to give myself permission to slow down and do things. But I really do appreciate everyone that we've talked to and the conversations that we've had and actually the time because – I think that's just kind of what I needed to take a deep breath and go, I know that this is true, but now I need to start implementing it. So I really have changed a lot of things about myself. I was kind of starting to do it at the beginning, but now, for example, um, I really like to work out a lot. And I, (laughs) when I started running, I was like, on the episode, I think it's episode four, I was like, okay, no, we're not going to do that. (laughs) It didn't feel right. So I've been lifting weights. I've been lifting a lot of weights, and this is something new for me. So I love that it's challenging, and I feel like I'm stronger, and it still gives me the endorphins and things like that. And it's just for me. And I go and I do it just for me. And it's like a commitment that I keep for myself. And it's really given me like a lot of more confidence. And I've a great pivot. Felt, I, I don't know, really good. And another one that kind of surprised me is I realized that I used to read all the time, but then I got out of it. Um, I just haven't read as much. And it was like I was gently reminding myself, like, remember how you love books? Remember how you love to read? So I've been, but like sitting down when there's so much to do just to read a book, even on a weekend, felt indulgent to me. And um, I couldn't let my brain like sort of slow down. So now I've been doing it. And at first I couldn't read as long as I did before. I mean, I used to be able just to read forever. And now I can. And I've been sitting down and going, no, you love to do this. This is how you want to live your life. And I love to read. (laughs) And I've been reading all these books and it makes me so happy. And so like little things like that have really helped. And, And I'll be really honest too, I didn't know if I was really going to bring this up or not, only because I'm just sort of at the beginning of it. But with my grief, I have a lot of like trauma associated, like that tripped up a lot of anxiety. And I've been working really hard over the last couple of years to make progress in that. But like mental health or like grief, you don't have control over it. And um, I felt completely just swept up in it. And so I actually went back to my doctor and I'm on antidepressants. And I think I'm not anti-drugs at all or medication. I really am not. But there was something inside of me that said, you should be further along in your grief by now. You use that for a while, but you don't need it anymore because we're getting better. You know, that internal dialogue that we talked a lot about in self-care, I've been a little bit more gentle with myself in saying some things are out of your control and it's okay. And and this is help and it's okay. And, and I'll tell you, my doctor is really, really great because I've been going to him for a really long time and so he knows me. And he sat there for a really long time and explained like emotionally and chemically what was going on in my body and how this made perfect sense and how I was doing a great job and that this was nothing. Like, it's like, let me give you a gold star. (laughs) No, but really, like you're functioning. It's good. Nobody else knows how bad it is. And let me help you. This makes perfect sense. And the way that he talked to me was kind. And I thought, oh, I've got to remember to talk to myself that way as well. 
So I really appreciate this series a lot. I really do. And Lisa, I love that idea of permission. Because I think a lot of our listeners are probably in a similar situation in which they... Maybe, whether they know it or not, are maybe waiting for that permission to take care of themselves the way they deserve and the way they need. Um, and, it, and it sounds like for you, you've had people like your husband, Chris, or like your doctor who have kind of been by your side to help you learn to give yourself permission, yeah. right? I think a lot of us need, I know I need, someone to give us that permission first, and then later on we can eventually learn to give ourselves that permission to take care of ourselves. Permission not just to maybe take a day off, but permission to have a hard time. Yeah. Permission to be struggling and not to feel like, okay, I'm struggling, but I can push through it. To just be, to, to let us sit in that struggle, I think having that permission to just be in a hard place and not feel like you have to white knuckle your way out of it. This um, isn't, this doesn't have to it. be yeah. a chapter in the book I'm going to write someday. Right. This right. can just be yeah. a hard chapter of my life. Yeah. yeah it's that, hard I to admit that, that um, for some of us. For other people, you know, I admire people and I'm so grateful for people who do talk about it so openly yeah. and say that was a really hard time for me. And for a while, it was just going to be like this, and I just had to sit in it. And when I hear other people, I, I just say that. It makes me, in my situation, feel less alone. And to feel like, oh, this is, there's nothing wrong. This is just how it is right now. It doesn't mean it's always going to be like this. But that's part of that nurturing and that sort of value that I was talking about in the beginning, too, of it's not just, hey, are you getting enough sleep and enough water? And are you talking to people and sunshine? It's also that value, like how do you see the value of who you are and do you, are you w- worthy of this? And the answer is yes. And this is your life and, you know, no one's coming to save you <laughs> and in, in kind of a, a dramatic way and that you've, you've got to take care of yourself uh, because that also informs how other people treat you. Well, and I also say like you're worthy of being taken care of not so that you can necessarily just be a better mother or a spouse yeah. or a friend. You're worthy to be taken care of for your own sake. Yep. You know? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling very um, like televangelist right now. The vibe <laughs> preach, I'm giving myself. preach, I know, but it's an important me- but, message. No, but yeah, it's like we, we like you deserve to be taken care of and uh, like you said, Lisa, most of the time that is going to have to come from yourself, but you can build a support system over time and have that around you. But really like you're not just given value by what you serve to other people. So anyways, it's something we've talked about in the season. So if you haven't listened to it, yeah, I should go out and listen to it. <laughs> Spoiler, it's so, pretty great. Yeah, yeah <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> episodes and I feel weird about this but it took me a few episodes before it occurred to me like hey I should be doing some of this stuff and so (laughs) it was I started with uh just like one thing that I heard in the Trey Christensen interview you might have I might have told you about this already but it was like oh take a different way to work that's something I know I can fit in um and so and it sounds easy and I know I can do it and also I get lost very easily but it's not too far from where I work so I think I can manage this and so I tried it. And on day one, I took a different route, just like the other side of the same square I normally drive to get to work. And I was like, huh, all right. I don't know if I got anything out of that, but that was an interesting experiment. Uh, Day two, I tried a different route to work, actually got lost, then was late. (laughs) Then there was like a meeting and I was like, what have I done? And then on day three, it's like, oh no, I'm taking the same route as I took the first day. I tried to take a different route. You're undoing what you already did. Right, and then... At that point, I realized, wait, wait, the point was for this to serve me, and this isn't serving me. This is making my life harder. And I turned left, and I went the right way to work that I always take. And I was like, oh, self-care is breathing and getting to work on time. And this was a little bit of a contrived effort to try something new. And I think it was still a useful experiment because then I started thinking about things in terms of, well, is this self-care? If I... (laughs) If I pick different socks, is this self-care? And even though those are like little things, I don't think 
I have really any systemized forms of self care in oh, but my it's, it's life. That, it's that meta analysis. It's taking a step back. Oh right? yeah, looking yeah. at your socks, your drive to work, and being like, how can I make this help my life be better and happier? You know, I think that's exactly what you're doing. That was exactly it, and it and suddenly I did find myself looking at other things and going, oh, here's here's this thing I've been avoiding or procrastinating. If I do it, I'm gonna feel so good and. And I started, yeah, I scheduled the appointment to change out the tires because my tires have been balding forever. And I keep <laughs> saying blah, 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 and it never happens. And and I started getting things done that I've been putting off, maybe because the only person it serves is me. And I went to the dentist. And I— Oh, I love that one. Self-care. Do you, do you love that, Lisa? Go no, to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> you love going to I, the dentist? Well, I, I mean, so many people put that off, and it is like a basic— I've read so many different studies about how, like, health care uh, in your mouth, your your yeah, gum disease totally. and teeth, like, affects your general health, your longevity. Your oral hygiene oh, matters. It matters. It matters. <laughs> Look at me getting excited. But it really only matters to me. And nobody else was going to remind yeah. me to do that because yeah. nobody necessarily knew. No one's checking in on that. And— and I actually think there might be a small part of me that's, like, a little bit self-destructive and, like, feels good when I don't do any of that stuff where it's just like, oh, I just don't even have time to get to me. But the truth is I do, and I just hadn't. And so I think it was a kind of nice because it allowed me to confront some of those tendencies and say, this isn't serving me. It's not serving anyone. And actually, I'm so much better as a person when I'm taking care of this. So— that was that was kind of cool. Even though the driving to work a different way didn't necessarily <laughs> do much for me personally, it kind of started a mental program that that right. has done a lot for me. Kind of lets you look at look at it from wow. thirty thousand feet a little more. Yeah, and know? that's kind of what you were saying about intentionality, yeah. like looking for more intentional ways to do the little stuff that I'm already doing. Yeah, because I've actually been I've been thinking about that a lot about too with like exercise because. Um, for like seven years now, I just have been in this constant cycle of being like, okay, you enjoy exercising. You enjoy working out. Like, why is it so hard to do on a regular basis? You know, why can I go months without, you know, lifting weights or playing sports and stuff? Um, because I was super active when I, uh, like 10 years ago, and now I feel like I'm never doing anything. And I, yeah, I think kind of a similar around the similar time, a couple episodes into the season, I started thinking about it more and realizing like, okay, like I like fun exercise. And that's when I started getting, I started getting into rock climbing because like, this is a fun thing that then motivates me to do all these other workouts and stay in shape and these sorts of things that motivate me to do this fun thing rather than guilting myself and shaming myself into feeling like trying to convince myself that I need to be doing it because I know that I should be just, I, I don't know, it's just the same thing. It helped me to take a step back and realize like, okay, what's important to me and what makes it easier and how can I have this serve me rather than me being a slave to the guilt and, and shame I feel out of obligation. So That's a huge paradigm shift. Yeah. I feel like I've experienced something similar to that just with my own spirituality, where when I think about how I related to all of that when I was younger, it was like, oh man, I think I was more spiritual back then, whatever that means, but yeah. <laughs> that's just how it occurs for me. And I and, and I don't know if these memories, if I can even count on them or not, but I think, I think of prayer as being easier. And as I've grown up, I've got more attentional issues than I did back then. And like, honestly, if I close my eyes and I try to talk to God, I can't even get to the end of the sentence before I'm thinking about what's in my Amazon shopping cart and then this conversation that I had that I'm replaying in my head. And then, and if I don't have my eyes open, I, I literally cannot get a single thought coherently finished. And, you know, things have just, things have just changed, but I think I'm still kind of making that comparison sometimes. And it's keeping me from, you know, doing something that I love and appreciating it for what it is and the value that it currently has in my life because I'm comparing it to what it used to be like. Ooh, that's a great life lesson too, isn't it? Because we're supposed to change. That's that's the intention of what we're doing, right? Like we want to become better and we want to improve. And yet when we do and life gets harder 
and situations and hobbies and conversations and relationships get harder because they change and that's going to require effort instead of just going along, you know, as things always have, then we panic a little bit, I think. And I, and I do think that it's okay to be a little bit more, like McKay was saying earlier, intentional about it and use it as an opportunity to get a, a bird's eye view of this situation and say, okay, is this still aligned with my value? Now, what kind of effort am I willing to make so that my habits, my daily actions, who, how I'm living my life, does it really align with internally who I want to be? Yeah. And I, and I think the tendency then is to think, okay, like I've taken this step back. I've seen what steps I can take. You then feel like you have to be able to do it yourself. Yeah. Like I feel like we have that uh, mm-hmm. old Protestant work ethic where we feel like, okay, now I need to solve this, you know? But I think keeping in mind that like sometimes that intentionality leads you to say, okay, I can't do this on my own. I can't solve my depression. I can't, you know, fix this financial situation without help. And I think keeping in mind that that next step, a lot of times, more often than we probably think, needs to be turning outwards and finding that support system that can help us do it in a safe way. I think Rather that's where than, people get absolutely. tripped up the most. Yeah, because then we feel guilty. Why aren't I just fixing it? Why can't? Why haven't I just solved this? And why don't I feel happy and better? Why haven't I taken all those steps on my own? When in reality, I'd say most of the time, at least from what I've learned in my own experiences, limited as they are, it, it, it involves turning outward and reaching out for help rather than doing it on our own. I couldn't agree more. Most things you really do need, we need each other for. Yeah, yeah. That might be what surprised me most about all of this is that is how much it's involved other people. I'm thinking about several of the things that we talked about where from we're talking about emotional or social or even just recently with some of the episodes on mental health where a lot of the really important takeaways have been like you need to reach out. You need to find friends, find strangers, find anonymous groups, find doctors, therapists, professionals, like get more help and stop trying to do this alone. Like self-care might be about taking care of yourself, but it's nothing about being by yourself. And so rarely is it about fixing it. Like it's not, it, it's so rarely is it like take these six steps and then on to the next thing in your life, you know? And more often than not, it's about building out a sustainable life for yourself that you can find joy and fulfillment in. Even if you do still have depression in 10 years or still, yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, putting a bow on something and then moving on to the next problem. What's your next piece of self-care that you have not yet implemented that you're going to? I mean, this is another one that I still have yet to deconstruct my, like, guilt cycle with. (laughs) But food. It's something that, like, I, I want to build, like... I don't know, building systems feels so like a corporate consultant. But like <laughs> like I, I want to have like systems of like my diet and nutrition in my life that don't constantly make me feel like I should be, I'm not doing good enough, you know? Yeah. Because like, uh, so all of my favorite foods are foods that on paper are bad for me, you know? <laughs> Which I also love lots of healthy foods, but it's like my wife's asking me what I really want to eat. I'm like fried chicken. I don't know. Yeah. But like I-, I It's delicious. It is. <laughs> darn, it is really I know, good. that darn deep fryer, man. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know necessarily how, but I do know that like taking a step back and really reevaluating, that's what my next thing is, is, is figuring out how and what I can change at least incrementally to make food a more constructive part of my life without having to go, you know, self-flagellation, <laughs> like, yeah. and like cutting out all the things I enjoy and that sort of thing. All right, I'm going to, so I love scrolling on my phone before I go to bed. And that puts some people to sleep. Like one of my very close friends, I've watched it happen. It takes 15 seconds of scrolling flat or TikTok or whatever it is. And then, bam, they are out like a light and the phone drops to the mattress. What's the science behind that? I thought blue light kept you awake. Yeah, me too. Oh my gosh, I'm jealous. Well, for me, that takes on average four hours and I can get through a lot of videos. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's not great, but it's funny because I think when I'm starting to do that, like my thoughts are, oh, I deserve this. I've worked so hard. I need a break. I need a rest. And I've been thinking about that a little bit during this series because it's like, ooh, that's really not self-care. That is 
self-destruction that's kind of posing as self-care because it leads to that four-hour thing and then I don't sleep and it's not great. So um, my self-care that I'm going to implement will be like a little bit more of a routine where I never bring my phone into the room where I sleep. I like that. That's a good one. So, okay. You can you can hold me to that. That's what yeah, I'm going to do deal. next and I'm going to... I'm going to trade that um, maybe poor quality self-care for some high quality self-care, which would be sleeping during the time that I have to sleep. I have a weird one. I realized during the introvert extrovert, like what do you need socially, that I have a lot of introverted friends, which I love and it's great. But I also realized that I need to be a little bit more proactive about being extroverted instead of just... Ooh. being extroverted. Mm. And I, again, it, it seemed easier with a partner, but I, no more excuses. I I want to like, I used to throw parties all the time, have mm. people over for dinner. I like to entertain. To me, it's no big deal. I like lots of people coming in and out of my house. And now that my kids are older and most of them have left and COVID and everything, I have felt that void and it feels off to me because I feel like I'm not really being like how I really want to be. And um, so I'm going to have more parties. <laughs> that's, that's so weird. And I know some that's of my great. introverted friends are like, oh, dear. But like even like smaller groups, because I realize that some of my happiest times are in groups where we're just laughing and being silly. There's a different sort of like dynamic. There's a different sort of feel. And, and just getting that hit a couple times a year is just not doing it for me. Yeah. I gotta well, have it more often. And when you're surrounded by introverts, those aren't just gonna happen. You have yeah. to go out and make They're them not happen. gonna throw the parties. No, yeah. they don't you. want to. They're like, are you Believe sure you me, want I to? hate throwing parties. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. The Lisa Show is a production of BYU Radio. The show is hosted by Lisa Valentine Clark and is produced by McKay Menden, Becca Hurley, Tabitha Freitas, Michael Combs, Kaya Dibb, and Brooke Soldani. Our music and post-production was done by Sam Clausen and Josh Fouts. If you haven't heard it already, our entire self-care series is available now. If you know somebody who needs to take better care of themselves, please send them our way.